Hello, hello. So what we're doing today is we're working on some Starfinder. We've got an adventure going and my characters have run off the beaten path. Uh, we're doing Dead Sons and Dead Sons has a really nice adventure path. We're in book four, which is Dead Sons, book four, The Ruined Clouds. Um, part of what they're doing is, they're, is they've landed on a floating city. And this floating city is called Istamak. And really all they're supposed to do in this, uh, they, uh, this is their ship down here. And they've landed made their way along and really all they're supposed to do is go to the house of renewal and the maze of ghosts which will then allow them the access to the temple found however they've been through the maze of ghosts and now they've just decided to wander to the city. So I've made a couple things. I've added a laboratory. And then, which I still need to populate. And then I'm in the middle of, uh, I've set a couple different um, random encounters for them. And those random encounters are in the book. I'm using the Fancy Grounds version of the Dead Sons Part 4. Right now, they are actually here. Where the little P symbol is uh, for the party, and I am using a map of a medical center I found, and we're going to pin the map so that way I can find it again quickly if I ever need if I ever close it, and so I've I labeled the different rooms within the map and so far I have different pins going on there in the middle of a fight right now I'm going through I've done all the way 1 through 9 I label them 1 through 9 with tokens that I have my token set and then pinned each one with different with the, each encounter or each room What I did was I went through to the AP, the uh, Adventure Path story entry over here. And if you go to Dead Sons, part four, which is where we are, right now they are in the forgotten city of Istamak. So this is the story entries as seen in Fancy Grounds. So under random encounters, they have the ones that they set up there. And so what I've done is I went ahead and I added some different ones.
up here underneath Exploring Istmac. If you look at the entryway for Exploring Istmac, it simply says at this point the PCs are free to roam around Istmac looking for clues. And this leads you to a link that shows you different parts of Istamac, um, the maps, some other things that you can do, and other uh, places that you can look for. And so, what I simply did is if you right click here within the story entry, you can right. Um, Make sure your group is the group you want, and in this case, I want Dead Sons. And I uh, create item. And so, since I have, they have 3.11 is exploring Istamac, I made 3.111.1 Medical Center right there. And then the other thing I added was 3.11.2, laboratory, laboratory. If they're still set on wandering around, then I will add some more. So for example, let's see, we'll just add 3.11.3. Close the story. And if we look here, there's a whole entry, in, entry here for the wooden entrance, the dreaming pool, hunting grounds. So this is a nice place to add some random creatures uh, for them to fight and run into. So we'll go ahead and name this 3.13 Hunting Grounds Randomness. And now, if I go back to if you go back to the story, you will see we have hunting ground randomness is there for us to use. You notice it's not actually shared yet; um, hasn't it's not it hasn't been opened and things. So the point is, this is an easy and quick way to add to a pre-existing adventure. This is the same thing you could do for Dungeons and Dragons on in Fantasy Grounds. Pretty much any published module, you want to make sure you have the correct one up here. Because um, if you don't, and you go up to the uncategorized category, see, you just have the one. And it's going to be a lot harder to find. Uh, if you happen to remember what it's called, then it might be a little easier. But... I don't remember those type of things very very easily, so I like to put it within the story, so if nothing else, I know where to find it. Another trick I use, right now we're going in there, since they're going through the medical center, this is the current story entry I'm using. So I click the Paizo symbol, or uh, again, if you're dealing with fantasy grounds, it might be a dragon symbol, it might be a little eye, really depends on the theme you're using. You grab this, and you can then notice how it disconnects. You can then drop it right down into any of these hotkeys that are down here. And then when I open up Fantasy Grounds, down here I have, oh, they're supposed to be going to the House of Renewal next. So here's the story entry for that. With the map and everything else, it's just right here for at right at my fingertips. Or I can go here to the medical center. And the cool thing about these hotkeys down here is you start with 12. Then if you hold down the control button, you'll notice it says C 1 through 12. And you see I have three more things. I, I use a critical failure deck that I converted. And it uses magical crits, melee crits, or ranged crits. So those are all available right there. 
but just by holding the C, holding down control and keeping it pressed, you can then have access to 12 more. You, if you do the Alt key, hold that down and, and wait, and you have 12 more. Here I have a summon creature list that I made for one of my characters who likes to summon monsters. Use the spell Summon Monsters. So I have all the, the creatures that he can summon right there. But I dropped it into the list down here. Same thing with Shift. So this is all my Starship combat things. Some of them I've made, some of them they have now. Uh, but again, it's Shift. The point being, you have 12. Then with Control, you have another 12. Alt is another 12. Shift is another 12. So that's 48 for those of you who are keeping count. And if 48 hotkeys isn't enough for you, you can hold Control and Shift, and now you have SC, 1 through 12. Control and Alt, 12 more. Alt and Shift, 12 more. So and they're very like uh, you can see as I switch and alternate through them, they're very easy to use and nice. You can do it with almost anything. So as a player, I like to use the hotkeys as well. They can be used for images. They can be used for um, actions, for weapons, for damage, saving throws, initiative. The main thing I, I almost always use it for is initiative. As a player, I use it for initiative. Um, you just need to be careful, especially with Starfinder, to make sure that you update it every time you level up. Because, for example, when it is not linked directly to the character sheet, it pulls whatever formula that you're using at the time and pulls it down to the link. So if your initiative is a plus three, then you level up or you get a magic item or something and take a feat that makes your initiative a plus four. It will and it shows on your character sheet as plus four. If you drag it down to your link down below, it'll still say plus three. So you just you just have to click it and drag it again. So let me show you what I'm talking about real quick. Here I have Fist. His initiative is plus two. So if I use this, I can just pull it down and drop it here into seven. Seven is one I always use for initiative. And that way, as I click through my different characters, I just hit F7 and it rolls it. So in this case, F7, boom, there you go. You see my initiative is 18 plus two. That says initiative plus two. So then say I get the feet improved initiative, it gives you plus four to your initiative checks. So we jump over here, we go improved initiative, drop it. Come in here, open up the magnifying glass, come here to his initiative, miscellaneous, is now plus four. So here it's six, so if you double click it here, it's going to roll 11 plus seven. However, if you go back to his initiative here, 19 is still only plus two, because it did not automatically, up, it does not link to the character sheet. It links according to whatever code you have when you drop it into that link, and into that hotkey. But all you have to do is a couple different ways. You can just drag it down and drop it in, and now it will work. Plus six. You can also right-click down here and clear the slot. You can also edit the label. So if I want to see, it says init. 
or uh, just clear the slot and then drop thing down there. As a GM, I use that clear slot a lot. As a player, I typically don't. But um, if you know, if I have a picture that I want to throw down there and have ready at my fingertips, or something that I want to share with my players, then and I'm done with it, I just clear it. Like we are now. We're done with that one. So that example, so we're clearing it. So there's, you can do that, like I said, with almost anything, any of these um, rolls, anywhere that has a little die on it, that's considered a roll. You can pull that down into these hotkeys. If you look at your actions, same thing. So you, you want your uh, your character loved using his reaction light reaction cannon. Pull it down to one of the drop bars and then pull down the damage. And then on his turn, boom, F8, or click it, and boom, it rolls the damage. If you have your kit, the enemy targeted, then hitting those hotkeys will do it for you automatically. Just remember, you have to update it when you level up, but it takes all of 30 seconds just to click and drag it back down there again a second time. So, in this medical center so far, we have a room where the spider is found in cryo. So what I'm doing is, in the character operations, I mean, I'm sorry, in the Alien Archive 3, they talk about companions in this book and how to use them. I have the Fantasy Grounds version of the Creature Companions, Alien Archive 3, I mean, and so what I'm going to do is, is I've set up a room, and in one of the rooms they're going to find a an, an Empathnid, which is one of the new... Companions, and that um, and Pathnet is going to be in cry has been in cryo, just waiting for one of the players to come find him. So, this something if you're not familiar with in all of Fancy Grounds, if you have any of the modules open, you can access the reference manual. And the reference manual, I use quite a bit as a dungeon master. Even a little bit as a player as well. This is like having the book in front of you. Um, and you can just sit there and you just go. Let me open it up a little bit for you. So you can just go, it's like page by page, everything is in here. Um, but the nice thing is, so say, you know, if you want everything here and it's all there by link, here's the empathnid I was talking about and what the empathnids do. I want to show you a quick little picture. It's interesting. I wonder why it's not showing up here. Is a, uh, see if it. I know it exists. It's just a matter of finding out what they put it under.
There he is. There he is. I'm not sure what they have this image labeled as, but oh, it's Fuzzy Spider. Okay. Now that's one way of figuring it out. Okay, and the nice thing is you can just go in here. Uh, it's read only. So, anyway. Alright, so that's your empathnid. And what he does is he's a little guy. He's a diminutive vermin. Um, and he gives you person who he is a companion for is a little bit of a boost. You get plus two morale bonus, saving throw against motion and pain effects. Honestly, doesn't come up that much. However, once per day is a standard action, an empath can inject its venom into a dying creature in its space, automatically stabilizing that creature. If you're dying, your empathic companion can use this action as though you were consciously directing it, but only to stabilize you. So, basically, it runs over and bite somebody and can save their life, stop them from having to spend resolve points to stabilize. So that way on their turn, all they have to do is spend the resolve point to get back in a fight and stay in a fight. So I say that all that to say, they're going to find one of these things. And if you don't know how to set up a companion with a new things that they've come out with recently, the new upgrades to Fantasy Grounds. It's much, it's very easy. Let's go ahead and clear that out. Slash clear. Oh, clears out your chat box. So if you go over to PC, you should be familiar with the how to make player characters and, and things like that. Now, they have a little doggy or wolf and it's player companions. Click on that and it opens up a second window and right click like you would anywhere else. Um, you can also click the edit list and, and add one. Right click, go down, create item. And now I have, we have a new companion. So this is the stream companion. And then what you do is you go over to a race, like you would um, with a character. Open up your races, and you'll see right there, companion races. As you're looking at the companion races, you then buy it, uh, you pick here the one that you need. There's also a way to make your own. So if you want to make your own companion race, that's a whole other video um, I might do later, but we'll see. Um, if there's an interest in that, then I'll, I'll cover that at an, another time on how to make your own companion. A lot of these are big. There's only two tinies. Um, a diminutive, which is the spider we're working with, and a medium. The rest are all large and huge. Uh, a lot of these companions are made to be used as mounts, intended to be used as mounts, I should say. And so uh, that's why they're, the sizes are so big. But as I said, you can make your own. So once you pick the one you want, so let's take a look at the Vorak. So the Voraks are eyeless, six-winged, Crow-like creatures come to the forested areas of Bethesda's moon. They travel in large flocks. Again, on the bottom, there's a little toggle buttons, PC and companion. So these puppies are, well, birdies. They have a fly speed, of course. Um, they're... If you want to know more about companions, um, they're, they're pretty cool. They're sort of a step up from the beasts in Beast um, for from like a Beast Master Ranger in 5e, Dungeons and Dragons. But you have to burn some feats in order to use your companions. Again, I can go into that in a little bit more detail, but without having the feet. They pretty much move, 
on their own, and that's pretty much it. Um, with the very first feat, you can then sacrifice your actions to give them that same action. So if you, um, they will move for free. But if you want them to move again, you can give up your move action and they'll do a move action. If you want them to attack, you can give up your standard action and they will do their, they can do a standard action. Um, unlike the beasts in D&D, they do level up. You, they can be leveled up, rather. Um, and they level up with you. You just simply have to pay for their training. And they, all of their stats go up. So their uh, armor class and uh, KAC, EAC goes up. Their attack, damage, their two hits, their, their save saving throws, all that will go up every level that you put the training into it. So we don't have a picture of these guys, um, but basically this is a bird, and they have two special abilities. Spellcaster's Apprentice, while your companion is adjacent to you, you gain a plus two to mysticism checks to disable a device, or to identify and repair magic or hybrid items. That's pretty cool. And the other thing they do is Magical transference once per day when you have line of sight to your Aurora companion you can cast a spell as though you were in that space instead of your own. So the cool thing is the difference between this and the uh, mages familiar in D&D, 5e at least, is in 5e you can do that, you can cast spells through it all day if you want, but they're only touch spells. Whereas here in Starfinder once a day, you'll be able to cast any spell as if your companion was the one that you were casting the spell through. So that's pretty cool. I don't have any Technomancers or um, any other spellcasters besides Mystics in my group right now. We have four in our group. And by the way, uh, if you're around on Sunday nights... With nothing else better to do, right now is our intent to to stream. We start from we go from five thirty to eight, two and a half hours on Sunday nights, Eastern time. Come stop by, say hello. So this seems pretty cool. I like him. That's a Vorak. And let's see what the Prug, a Prug, I think, is the Ooze. Yep. So the Oog, Prug, uh, the Prug is an Ooze. He can shape change. He can turn into different things. Um, has blind sight. And he can pretend it to be an inanimate object. So, uh, you have <laughs> the quote the airplane you can be. What can you make out of this brug? I can make an airplane or a hat or a brooch. Anyway, uh, so they can be an accessory and it adds to your disguise check. So you can even be a pair of glasses with a big nose and a fake mustache. Or he can look like an object just sitting there on a modern to look, look like a vase or a uh, battery just sitting on a, on a shelf. Uh, he can do that. Um, so they're pretty cool. But I'm, I think I like the Vrock better. So we're going to go with the Vorak. And so to make this companion, we've already added him to name. So if you see there's inventory, notes, where it says race, you can just bring over Vorak. All right, now it's making me a liar. <coughs> Excuse me. New to streaming, didn't mean to cough at you there. I'll know to mute it next time. All right, so on the main page, you drop them in. Now you'll notice uh, their level range for a Vorak is 5 to 12. So it automatically starts at level 5. As I mentioned with the... So all companions have the same stats. 
with exception, like everything else in Starfinder. So you'll see here uh, when you open up the Vorak race gives you their, their level range of size, but then it also has the saves. So they have a poor fortitude and poor reflex. So then that's denoted here, so two and three. But they have a good will save. And that's uh, plus seven at level five. They have 55 hit points, so pretty much everything that is um, level five, all the companions that are level five, with a 10 constitution will have 55 hit points. Unlike heroes, they don't have stamina, but unlike NBCs, when they take a uh, short rest, they get a large portion of their hit points back. I believe it's half, um, but again, um, I had to double check that for sure. And but I do know that they get a lot of their wounds back after a short rest. So at level 5, he has an EAC, KAC, 1619. Again, his ability modifiers as a Vorak is Wisdom and Charisma. So you see he's got plus 4, plus two, 12. I mean, uh, 14 and 12 Charisma. Intelligence is very low. And cool thing is he does have Blind Sense that's based on Thought. So his blind sense is not based on tremor sense, you know, or things that walking on the ground where he can feel the tremors, or uh, some of them have hearing, um, some of them have echolocation like a bat. This one has thought. So if, if it has a mind, then he can detect it, um, even though he can't see because he is sightless. But anything with a thought, he can see. I'm not sure how they go over you know, how they then deal with, if he's blind, how does he stop from flying into windows all the time, or walls, for that matter. But, hey, it's Starfinder. It's a magic world. So he doesn't have a token. It's the other thing you need to add. So in this case, here is he is a bird. I've got some Aarakocra tokens here. Um, I may end up just using one of those. These are different. Uh, tokens I have from different things that I've used. Alright, so the only other thing I have would be animals. Let's see what kind of animals I have. A wing snake. Um, Just the paw monsters. Yeah, let's just use a bird. Let's just use, oh, how about a sturge? Sturges have several wings, let's see. Spider. Sylph, siren, stone. PQRC, huh. This does not have a sturge. Okay. Then we'll just give him a regular old birdie. Let's see. This is a cool looking gloom bird. There we go. We'll make we'll give it to a Vorak. There we go. So now he has a token. Alright, so now your companion is ready. Let's say uh, you can it tells you he's a tiny magic beast. You can type any notes about his appearance, any notes you want to make. Um, inventory, it shows you how much their encumbrance is. The cool thing about the companion character sheet is remember how I talked about you can train your character? So my character is a level 8. So say they found him at level 5, they can spend a week and train him and get him up to level six. So it would cost 2,200 credits to get him up to level six. Once they do that, put your cursor over the level and all you do is just move your mouse wheel as the DM, boom, he's down level six. Uh, it should be more than that, but we'll move on. So, uh, and then uh, you can go up again to level seven. 
since my character is a level 8, that's where we want him to be, is level 8. Cost 3600 to get him up to level 9. Um, you'll notice here, now that we're, we've are we added 3 more levels, everything has gone up. Instead of being 55, he's up to 90 hit points. Instead of 337, he's now 448. Um, he's got 20, 23 uh, armor classes now. Um, even his skills here have gone up. And by the way, survival um, is can only be used. Does it say no? Okay. Um, his he his attack went up. So if he attacks somebody, ooh, a nice crit there. He does one d twelve plus eight slashing. Uh, at, a, at a level 8. Um, so we'll bring him back down to 5 where he was. He was only doing 1d4 plus 5. So it's 1d12. Quite a jump here at level 8. Um, the characters themselves are doing quite a bit more damage. 1d4 plus 5 would be silly at uh, level 8 against the things that they're coming against. So it's really neat how they did this companions and the fantasy grounds version of it is phenomenal it makes it so easy so much easier than paper and pencil but you'll notice we're missing one main thing here who is his owner so the only way to add a companion owner is to have the character playing um, i'm not going to go through that right now but Once your character is playing, there's a companion right here. So you would click his token up here once the character has selected it. And you just drag this over to the companion bar and it fills in the ownership. It's very simple. Um, I don't know if you're aware of this, but if you go to Fantasy Grounds, you can open up a second occurrence of Fantasy Grounds and join your own game. So right now I have, you can see I do it a lot, I have DM Extra. And so, I'll just show you what I'm talking about real quick. While we wait for that to load for a moment, you can watch the, there it is. Um, and then we'll add the companion to Dorson. You'll notice here, if we go to PCs, companion to PCs, I have Arach Arachnid. Because I already made the uh, spider guy. See, they haven't been found yet, so that's why they're not assigned. But you'll see it up here. So let's go ahead and, and assign this now that we're open. Give me just a minute for Fancy Crown to finish loading. Got a lot going on. I've got the stream going. I've got um, all right. So on my second, in my second. Uh, Instance of Fantasy Grounds, I have, I grabbed the character Fist. So now that he's been, there's a, there's a player who's available and playing. All you do is just go over here, grab him and go over to Companion, bam. Now you see the owner is Fist. And the nice thing is, Fist can now open it up anytime he wants, and he has access to his companion. Um, yep, so he has access to his companion. I'll just check something real quick. And 
if you ever need to get rid of it. Say he wants to switch out, you can only have one companion at a time. Right click as DM on the on this and you can rest him by the way. Uh, let's see, right click on here. There it is. And delete it. Now the owner is cleared, there's nobody here. While he is owned as an owner, if you go back to PC, you'll see, there he is. So that is how you add a companion. We now have two companions. I don't know if I'll add that magical bird into the mix or not. Um, the thing that uh, that's stopping me is my character, my players. So we have one player who's running two characters, and another player who will then who will now be getting a companion. So. I think for now, that that will be good. It'll be a good party balance, having this extra little companion thrown in there. I'm gonna have a magic item that gives them the feet that they need in order to control the companion. So here it is in order. What is this? Okay, so anyway, so the first one is adept, and as I mentioned before, you, uh, you besides having a, you have to have a rank in survival. Um, you can then take a standard action to grant your companion a standard action, a move action to grant it a move, or swift to grant it a swift. Just as I mentioned before, with a basic level feat, you can then trade your actions for the creature's actions. And as it bumps up each feat, you have less actions that you have to take in order to grant your companion an, an action. So the next level is expert. You have to have the first one, adept, and then four ranks in survival instead of just the one, but now your companion can all can take one reaction per round to, for free. So it can move before, now it can take a move, and it can also react. And in addition, you can grant your companion a standard action for a move action instead, and you can grant a move action for a swift action. So, um, it makes it a little bit easier to move, and then as you move up, it gets, keeps going in that same vein. You have to have higher survival ranks, and you can now do more things as you go along. So, it can take a full attack action at the uh, Companion Master level with a minus 6 to both attacks instead of the minus 4 that we would normally get. Um, and after, on each round on your turn after you act, your creature companion can take either a move or a standard action in addition to its normal move. So we can do double move or get move and attack. So, and the last one is Virtuoso. You have to have a, at least a 13 survival. And again, you've already taken all the three other at, uh, skills already, feats already. And your companion can now take a full attack with minus four instead of a minus six. So it's pretty much another character and you don't have to worry about giving it anything. You don't have to do anything to it. It, it can now control, it can now controls itself. And um, so companions are nice and the way you do it is the same with all of them. Also down here, uh, you also have three different types. I mean, these are the feats. So I could have just gone by with companion and made it made my life simpler, but I didn't know that was there. 
So you also have combat train mount and mounted expert for things that you can use with your with your companions. As I mentioned, most of them, majority of them, are large and huge for use as mounts. All right, so we've got a little bit, a few more minutes here before I'm going to sign off. If any of you are watching this uh, during the as a replay, feel free to shoot me a message. Uh, you can stop by on Sunday nights and say hey. Also, you can come uh, to the Discord. Um, Parker decided to say hello. That's right, it's Parker. He's a main pin. Decided to say hello. He smells food cooking, so he's starting to be nice to me so he can maybe get something from, from during my dinner. Anyway, back to Starfinder. So in the medical center, so that's where, so that's what the spider is that they're going to find in cryo. Um, and then I have several other rooms that I've made. Uh, I have an encounter that I made. Another encounter. This room, they found, they're going to find some items, uh, including some x -Lite. And then all right, so I'm left with D, so I have room E and onward. So let's take a look at my map real quick. So I have E through H I J K L M. Um, M is over here, and N. J, K, L, M, okay. So, um, basically had this whole portion here to deal with. I've had a pretty busy medical center. These two are, have like offices, desks, look like little desks. Um, these two look like little not sure what those are. This one here is like a is, is a waiting room. Some magazines and stuff. All right. So this one end is going to be empty. Um, and then I did I did have an idea for a couple robots show up. Uh, that's, those of you who aren't familiar with the storyline, I'm going to minimize this. They show up on Istamac. The whole concept is they're hunting down these Cult of the Devourer people. And this cult wants to bring back their deity, Cult of the Devourer, uh, whose whole purpose in life is just to destroy everything. Uh, never really understood the logic there. Never really understood the logic behind having a villain who does that, but it shows up in almost every genre. But they have found these clues to this weapon called the Stellar Degenerator that can destroy the sun of a of a solar system, thus destroying everything within that solar system. And the party is hunting down these cult, this cult, these cults of the Devourer, who are trying to find this, this weapon. They've been brought here. If you're familiar with Starfinder, you'll know there's a thing called the Pact Worlds, or it's a system of planets around the old Galarian, which is what Pathfinders used to be. And this is outside of that. This is outside the Pact Worlds. Uh, and they're in the Vast, which is outside the Pact Worlds. They've come to this place. Uh, there's a huge gas giant. The only sign of life around this gas giant is this floating island. And on this floating island is the city of Istamak, as you saw. Uh, and with the map, you can see that it's just uh, some crumbled area around it. Um, 
I'll pull that map up again so you can see the gas giant is all around it. Uh, this is called the Broken Land, where they'll eventually be, be going. When the cult came here, this is where the majority of the people here, they're called Kish, K-I-S-H. The Kish live here in a community. The cult of the Devourer people came were some nice enough, long enough to get into this temple found, uh, which is basically an, an old foundry. Grabbed what they wanted to go, what what they found, needed, and then left. So they were not very nice people. Made the Kish really angry, and so the Kish decided to block everything off and not allow anybody into the temple anymore. Now, what happened? What, what had happened was these with this Istamac is that the race has been gone, and they have de-evolved. That so this whole place looks somewhat like a technologically advanced race, and they were, but over several thousand years, maybe even um, tens of thousands of years, they've, they've devolved into savages and a barbarian type race who live in this little city that's left now. So everything here are ruins except for the, the place that they've rebuilt sort of up in the top left. I'm sorry, the top right. But they don't use it um, and they don't... Um, use any of the technology. They use bows and arrows and they use uh, spears um, as their weapons, javelins, things like that. Um, so everything throughout the city is mostly ruins. And the only things of interest, there's a handful of places, but the party, as I mentioned earlier, the storyline is written for the party to go here to the House of Renewal and to the Maze of Ghosts, and that's it. There are some other places, but all, all these things have is a little paragraph. Um, so for example here, Monument Hill, that's everything it tells you about this Monument Hill. Um, so my party decided to go wandering the streets. So now I'm, um, they've taken and they've studied, gone through all of these buildings here, all these buildings here, all these buildings here, and they're now in the medical center. Um, they're eventually gonna be going over to the house for renewal. And hopefully we can progress the storyline at that point. I've been trying to impress upon them that, hey, this cult is ahead of you already. And the longer you wait, the longer you mess around, the farther ahead of you they're getting. Uh, so, um, I also have another trick I'm going to use here. After a few hours, uh, probably after the, the laboratory that they found, laboratory, if they don't um, want to go to the house of renewal after that, they're probably going to get a message from the Starfinder Society telling them, hey, get a move on. You've wasted enough time, basically. So, we'll see how it goes. I, I'm also made a couple other random encounters for them to come across. Um, the book has three random encounters for them, and then, so I've incorporated them at different parts throughout the city as well. So, we'll see how it goes. Um, I'm going to finish work on the medical center a little bit later tonight. So if anybody's out there in Twitch land watching this rerun, I appreciate your time. Hopefully, hopefully you're like me and you've watched it on a little bit faster speed than normal <laughs> because I only have so many hours in a day and I enjoy watching things faster. So I usually watch it at one and a half or 1.25 speed. Um, 
that way I can get, I can watch more things but um, feel free to uh, reach out to me at Spencer77 at yahoo.com um, I not on Twitch or any of those things yet um, but we will be back here Saturday I'll be GMing a game of Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition the Rick and Morty came out with a starter set the people who make Rick and Morty combined with D&D so it's the Dungeons and Dragons um, Dungeon of Rickedness R-I-K Rickedness uh, and so Rick and Morty does D&D is what we do on Saturday night I am the DM on that. It's actually being hosted by Rob Tui on his channel. Um, but I'll be uh, streaming it here because I'm the DM. And then on Sunday night, we do Starfinder. Woohoo! My true and real love. And we will um, be looking to... Uh, I'm the GM for that. And so I hope to see you there Sunday night at 6.30.